This is the second in two lectures on the book of First Thessalonians, and we're studying what Paul has to say about himself as he reviews his activities uh, during those few weeks that he spent in the city of Thessalonica during the second missionary journey. He says he was a suffering traveler, a faithful steward, a gentle mother, a tireless laborer, a consistent example, a concerned father, a homesick brother, an expectant soul winner, and then number nine, a mission a superintendent. The reason he says this, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, because we've already seen, of course, how Paul was driven from Thessalonica and Berea by the unbelieving Jews, and from Berea then he went to Athens, and while he was there he sent Timothy who had remained in Berea, back to Thessalonica as sort of a short-term missionary to strengthen the young church. So he was a mission superintendent in, in many ways. Uh, he sent Titus later on to the Isle of Crete, and then he told Titus to stay there. So some have felt that Paul was a, was a bishop and that the modern uh, bishop uh, uh, system uh, has justification in the scripture because the pastor shouldn't uh, go where he wants to go. He should, be, he should go where the, where the bishop tells him. But he was not a bishop, but he was a mission superintendent, and he did feel free to send these young uh, men on his staff, as it were, around to various places. So here he sends uh, Timothy from Berea to Thessalonica to check on the church. Now, in this passage, when he writes the letter, upon meeting Timothy later on, of course, he asked the Thessalonians not to pity him because of his many sufferings. <clears throat> Doubtless they had heard about him, the sufferings that he had endured uh, even before he came to Thessalonica. They'd heard what he went through when he got beat up in Philippi. And no doubt they had heard what happened after he left the city of Thessalonica. But he said, I don't want you to, uh, to uh, shed crocodile tears for my sufferings uh, because... He says that his trials had neither shaken him nor surprised him. For he said, we were appointed thereunto. Chapter 3, verse 3. That's a remarkable statement there, by the way. We were appointed thereunto. And often those who believe in predestination, uh, they limit it to salvation or service, uh, but they're not too concerned about suffering. If you're going to take it for those two, you need to take it for suffering also, that Paul would later say that it is uh, given to you not only to, uh, you know, to enjoy things with Christ down here to serve him, but to suffer with him also. And some, next time something really traumatic comes in your life, and uh, you don't know why, and it isn't a result of your sin, you not only take Romans 8.28... Uh, as your comfort verse, for all things work together for them to love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. But also you turn to 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, for we are appointed thereunto, and you keep this in mind, that before the foundation of the world, that God designed this suffering that's now in your life to make you more like Jesus. Now that's suffering predestination. Um, William MacDonald has a statement here. He says, Paul reminded them that even when he was in Thessalonica, he used to tell them that Christians are appointed to afflictions. His predictions came true in their own lives. How well they knew it. They had been suffering also. Trials form a necessary discipline in our lives. And then MacDonald, this author, uh, offers five reasons for suffering. Number one, they prove the reality of our faith and weed out those who are mere professors. Uh, suffering will separate, if not the men from the boys, it'll certainly separate the professors from the possessors. And secondly, suffering enables us to comfort and encourage others who are going through similar trials. And of course, Paul brought that out in 2 Corinthians 1. And then they develop certain graces, such as patience, 
in our character. Romans 3, verse, Romans 5, verse 3. The fourth reason for sufferings and uh, for trials, they make us more zealous in spreading the gospel. And number five, they help us to remove, they help to remove the dross from our lives. So trials form a very important, necessary discipline in our lives. Number 10, Paul's self-description, he describes himself as a prayer warrior. Notice, night and day praying exceedingly. Do you remember when Paul was saved? And in Acts chapter 9, he was uh, taken, uh, led to the home there in uh, Damascus. And God appeared then to a believer and a disciple by the name of Ananias. And he said, Ananias, go and minister to Paul, for behold, he prayeth. And so he began his ministry by praying. And he prays all through his ministry without ceasing, he says, day and night. And he ends his ministry by praying. Paul would pray at the drop of a hat. He prayed for churches. He prayed for new converts. He prayed for Israel. He prayed for young pastors. He prayed for his enemies. Paul prayed without ceasing the prayer warrior. He could, his whole life actually, uh, was sort of a walking commentary on that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. It was more than an hour though, it was Sweet Life of Prayer with Paul. Sweet Life of Prayer that calls me from a world of care. All right, now, what did he pray for in this particular epistle? Well, for two, three basic things. Number one, that he might be allowed a return visit to Thessalonica. As far as we know, God answered that prayer at a later date. And the second thing he prayed, that the Thessalonican believers would increase and abound in love one toward another. Now, we assume that God answered that prayer also. And then, chapter 3, verse 13, that God would establish their hearts unblameable in holiness. Paul was hoping that they would have the same testimony among their contemporaries that he had among them when he was there. And when he said that, you know what manner of life I led while I was with you, and now he's praying, actually, that they would follow his example, that they would experience what he had experienced. So, in this second division, now we have looked at a review of the church, the activities of the shepherd, what Paul says about himself while he was in Thessalonica. Now the activities of the sheep in Thessalonica, what Paul says about the converts that he led to Christ there. He brings out these two points. He said they had accepted God's word as truth in the midst of suffering. And secondly, they longed to see Paul again as much as he wanted to see them. Someone has said, and that's probably why they turned out to be pretty enthusiastic Christians because of the circumstances surrounding their conversion. Someone said they suffered and they paid a price to accept Christ. It's been said that the trouble of Christians today is nobody's trying to kill us. You see, for the first three centuries, uh, the devil attempted to persecute the church, to burn it to the ground, to destroy it, to murder all Christians, and he succeeded in killing a lot, but for every one he killed, two would quickly rise up and take uh, their place. And so finally, with the advent of Constantine in 325 A.D., the devil gave up on this attacking the church from without. He'd keep it up every now and then just to keep in practice, but he changed his tactics, and what he did is this. He... he uh, put on his Sunday go meet and clothes, and he attended church, he walked the aisle, he applied for church membership. And really, from that point on, from about the third century on, he has done his deadliest work, I think, from within the church. But uh, here they gave their hearts to Christ, and Paul 
thanked God in prayer that they did this while they were suffering. It meant more to them because they had a bigger price to pay uh, when they accepted Jesus as Savior. So this is what he says about the activities of the sheep in Thessalonica. And then number C, the activities of the serpent in Thessalonica. And he'd meant this serpent before, uh, this uh, anaconda of uh, the Judaizers, as it were, uh, like a, a vile snake, had followed Paul everywhere he went. And they had hounded his uh, very steps. And he says in another book, he said that they are the enemies of Christ. He loved them, but he said that they are enemies of Christ. And he said, I, I weep with weeping, he said, I, I tell you this. So his worst enemies, Thessalonica, as in other places, of course, were the vicious Judaizers. And the Judaizers were those uh, professing Christians uh, that wanted to take Jews and Gentiles both and put them back under the full bondage of the law, uh, would demand that Gentiles be circumcised and would refuse to allow believers, Jews or Gentiles, to worship on Sunday, but on the Sabbath, and we have some Judaizers today, certain churches, certainly that are not vicious perhaps, but they're as confused and they are as corrupt in their theology as the Judaizers were some 2,000 years ago. And how Satan had used them. Notice what he says here. He said, they had killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. They had persecuted us and they pleased not God and are contrary to all men. They had forbidden Paul to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. We have this note that Paul had been accused of being anti-Semitic. And I think it's sad that we sort of have to watch that today. I guess the pendulum has swung from one side to the other. It used to be that uh, it, uh, it was popular to uh, ridicule the Jews, and certainly that's a terrible sin. The truth of the matter is the Jews did kill their Messiah. Now, that doesn't absolve me as a Gentile sinner from the death of Christ because, in a very real sense, my sin put him there too. All sinners were guilty, not only Jews, but Gentiles and Romans alike, in putting Christ on the cross. But I don't think that this helps the matters at all uh, to uh, just uh, bury our head in the sand concerning this historical fact that Paul brings out here. And no one on earth that ever lived or ever will live, apart from the Savior, who's always, of course, been in existence, uh, has loved the Jews as much as the Apostle Paul. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And he makes his statements about his own people. And no one else could say as he did under inspiration, for I wish that myself could become accursed for my people, the people of Israel. No, he was not. He was anything but anti-Semitic. But he was honest here. And he describes now the attacks uh, that uh, had been leveled against him through the Jews, energized by Satan. All right, uh, in verse 18, we've already made mention of this before, that he desired, he wanted to come see them the second time instead of writing that letter, but he couldn't do it. And he said, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, time and time again, I've made plans to come to you, but Satan hindered us. There's so much involved in that verse. You ever stop thinking about that? I wonder how Paul knew that Satan hindered him. Apparently, he had uh, such a close relationship to the Savior that he could actually sense uh, when something prevented him, whether it was the Spirit of God or just human circumstances like inclement weather or something, or whether he was actually being subjected to an all-out attack by the devil. Uh, I'm not sure I, I've usually been able to, to determine if something happens, whether it's the Lord or the devil, until I really pray about it and examine the matter. But apparently Paul, well, very obviously, Paul was able to do that because he could write dogmatically, Satan kept me from visiting you. Paul knew not only the power of the Savior, 
but he also knew the power of the serpent. And sometimes I think we underestimate both the power of the Savior, and this leads to unbelief or pride. I'm sorry, this leads to, if not unbelief, at least to despair, perhaps, because we don't think Jesus can do something for us. Or we underestimate the power of Satan. And I think this leads to pride because we're not concerned uh, about our enemy. But Paul was. All right, the reputation of the church, chapter 1. The review of the church, chapters 2 and 3. And then the removal of the church. Here he's speaking about the catching up of the church into the heavenlies. Notice the challenge of this removal. I've said already that the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians can be favorably tied in with the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. These are the two most important and well-known passages on the doctrine of the rapture. The challenges of the rapture, because of this removal, someday the church that was promised in Matthew 16 and was born in, in Acts chapter 2 and was established in the book of Acts itself will be taken out in 1 Thessalonians 4, will be removed. Now because of this, the Bible says that the challenges are twofold. Number one, because of this removal, the Christian is to know God's will and he is to know God's way. What is God's will? What does God want me to do? And I ought to know this because someday he's coming again to receive me unto himself and he's going to ask me concerning those things that I've done. And one of the questions is, have you done what I wanted you to do? So because of this removal, we better know God's will and ask ourselves the question, what does he want me to do? And am I doing it? Well, in verse 3 of chapter 4, Paul says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. I may not know God's will for you concerning whether you should marry that person you may be considering marrying now, or whether you should leave that job or take that church or, or uh, buy that house or, or make that flight. Uh, to a certain place. I may not know God's will, but I know God's will in this matter for every single person listening to this tape. Here's God's will for your life. Take it from me, because I've taken it from Paul. Here is God's will for your life. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. So uh, because of the challenge, the, uh, the removal at the rapture, uh, we need to know God's will. Not only that, but because of this removal, the Christian is to know God's way. Not only what he wants me to do, but how he wants me to do it. And I think the, first, the second is almost as important as the first. I think probably I have missed God's will more method-wise uh, than goal-wise. Let me repeat that. I think I have missed God's will more times method-wise than goal-wise. In other words, God has laid upon my heart to do a certain thing. And uh, sometimes that, that comes to me pretty uh, rapidly. I mean, I zero in on this, and it's, it's uh, crystal clear what God wants me to do. And as soon as I find out what he wants me to do, I just, I'm dumb in that area, I suppose, and I just charge it like a wounded bull, and I, I jump where angels fear to tread. Uh, and I'm not as concerned about how to do God's will as I am about what his will is. But many a person can go wrong in attempting to, to do the reveal will of God if they don't do it in the right way. There's a song, uh, Teach Me to Pray, Lord, Teach Me to Pray. And uh, the chorus goes, I long to know thy will and thy way. Teach me to pray, Lord. Teach me to pray. I think God's way is just as important as God's will. And uh, I can't stress that too much. Do you remember in the Old Testament, God's will on a given occasion for Moses was for him to come in contact with a rock and through that rock and Moses' faith and obedience, 
uh, to slack the thirst of the uh, Israelis in the desert there. Now, God's will was to take care of their thirst, all right? But he had a way to accomplish that will. And God's way was for Moses to speak to that rock. But what happened? Moses became angry. Uh, they'd been bugging him all day, all that month, for example, uh, for, for, and uh, for a matter of fact. And, and so he became angry. And so he grabbed a stick and he blew up and he really just lost his cool. And, and he began to beat on that rock with that stick and said, Hear ye rebels. And he called call them a few choice names. Well, the water came out. And God's will was accomplished because their thirst was slackened. But his way did not, uh, was not practiced. So what did he do? He took Moses later on behind the woodshed and he spanked him. And he said, because you have not done what I told you to do, you will not enter the promised land. So God's will was done. But because Moses didn't do it in God's way, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. A man who missed the way of God and not the will of God. And here Paul mentions both, of course. So um, how does God want me to do his will? And then he lists four things here by abstaining from fornication, by defrauding not his brother, by loving his brother, by quietly working until and patiently awaiting for the great day of God's removal. That's the challenges of the rapture, of the removal. Now, what about the chronology of the removal? Well, in this passage, Paul answers a question that had bothered the Thessalonians. And here's what the Thessalonians, rather, the church of Thessalonica. And uh, here's the problem. When he was among them, in Acts 17, they had doubtless learned many precious truths about the glorious return of Christ to earth someday and the establishing of the kingdom. Paul was a prophecy buff. Well, of course, he wasn't a buff. That's an amateur, and he was a heavy. He was a pro, uh, but uh, he loved to talk about prophecy, and he doubtless uh, explained to them some of the glories of the prophecies there in Isaiah and uh, where the lion will lay down with the lamb and everything. So he told them a lot about the millennial kingdom and everything. In fact, he made it so real that to some of them, uh, it just seemed to be around the corner. And in fact, he made it too real for some. And when we come to Second Thessalonians, we'll see why a number had just sat down and refused to work because the rapture probably happened tomorrow anyway. So we'll sell everything that we have and just sort of live on the street here until uh, get our... Uh, don our robes of white and listen to Gabriel's blowing of the trumpet. Uh, so he'd made it very real to him. Well, but when he left, uh, a number of believers had died. A few had died and then some more. And so uh, these believers that had departed this earthly scene obviously wouldn't be on the earth when Christ came again. And so, well, they thought, now, did this mean they're going to miss everything? They're in the ground and they're not on earth. And so this is in the background to the great rapture passage here before us in chapter 4. What he's attempting to do now is to explain, he's attempting to actually to comfort as well as to explain the hearts of those individuals that have lost loved ones since he departed from Thessalonica. Uh, these next six verses, chapter uh, 4, verses 13 to 18, thus present for us, uh, the following uh, uh, outline here, eightfold outline, a realization of those events that will take place. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And Paul did not desire us to be ignorant brethren. I have a friend who's a member of the Grace Brethren Church, and we always kid each other, or he kids me about uh, baptism, and I kid him about, uh, I said, well, I don't know whether the Baptist church is right or not, but yours can't be, because the Bible says, be ye not ignorant, brethren. And he said, there's a comma in there, <laughs> be ye not ignorant, comma, brethren. And I have another friend said, well, uh, 
he said, you can be whatever you want, but he said, uh, in heaven you're all going to be what I am now, and he belongs to the United Brethren Church. Uh, but uh, at any rate, there are three areas uh, uh, besides what Paul has talked about here that God would not have us to be ignorant concerning, and not only concerning the rapture, but he would not have us to be ignorant concerning those events in the Old Testament. He would not have us to be ignorant concerning the restoration of Israel. He would not have us to be ignorant concerning the manifestation of spiritual gifts. And then he would not have us to be ignorant concerning uh, prophecy. And you know, it's, I don't think it's an accident that the four areas in which most Christians are the most ignorant of today are these four areas. Let's look at them again. Uh, that of prophecy. You have the all-millennialist and, and uh, you have the post-millennialist. There's a group now, a vicious group, certainly not all, uh, well, actually not post-millennialist. There's a, there's a mid-tribulation group that's absolutely vicious. And uh, they're, uh, they adapt the, the tactics almost of an Adolf Hitler in uh, getting across uh, their hate literature. And they ridicule any pre-millennialist, any pre-tribulationalist. And they say that uh, we're of the devil and that uh, we just uh, do this uh, to write books, to sell books, to make money, and we're insincere and probably not even saved. As I say, it's a vicious attack. Uh, now, we don't have to agree on prophecy. There's no doubt about that. But we do have to respect the sincerity of the other person. You may not be a, a pre-millennialist, but you need to respect my position, and I need to respect yours. And you may not believe that the rapture will take place before the tribulation, as I believe the Bible so clearly states that it will. You may not believe that. And, uh, but I am not to doubt your sincerity, and I am not to doubt your, uh, your love for Christ. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a lot of confusion in this, and prophecy. And Paul said, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning these things. And then... Uh, very few people know anything about the Old Testament afar, apart from a few of the miracles and the Jonah and the, and, uh, the fish's belly and, the, and uh, Daniel and the lion's den. But uh, Paul says, I wouldn't have you be ignorant, brethren, about the Old Testament. He said, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant about the restoration of Israel. And you have a lot of uh, covenant theologians running around today and saying God is done with Israel and the church has become Israel. You see, they don't understand. They're ignorant maybe sincerely, but ignorant concerning God's plan for Israel. And God doesn't want him to be that way. And then, of course, how uh, this fourth area has been corrupted today. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. I suppose the most perverted subject confronting Christianity today is the subject of tongues. The modern charismatic movement has totally, if not perverted, uh, certainly misinterpreted uh, this precious doctrine of the manifestation of spiritual gifts. And Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant. But there's more ignorance and more stupidity and more uh, a lack of facts, I think, in this one area than in any other area in the entire scope of Christianity today. So a realization. Paul wants them to be aware of certain things. And then a repose, a sleep. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Repose. Of course, <clears throat> after the, uh, well, actually it begins, I think, uh, before the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, I think in John chapter 11. From that point on, uh, a believer's departure from this earth is described as a sleep. Uh, we're told that Lazarus sleepeth, Jesus said that. And later we're told that Stephen said, uh, or that after Stephen prayed, the Bible says he fell asleep in Jesus. And so Paul discusses a realization here. He wants him to know certain things. And then he talks about a repose, about a sleep. Now this is body sleep, <clears throat> the body sleep of departed believers. Uh, the doctrine of soul sleep is totally unscriptural. And we have in your notes a refutation of that position. But the body of D.L. Moody is reposing in the ground somewhere on the east coast in the cemetery for the last 78 years. Moody died in 1899. But Moody, for 78 years, has been doing, as he once said he would do, uh, handstands on Hallelujah Avenue in heaven. So he's been with Jesus, as Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But Moody's body 
is now in the state of repose. And Paul speaks about that there uh, in this verse here. So you have a realization, a repose, and then a revelation. And here it is. For this we say unto you <coughs> by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or shall not precede them which are asleep. And of course, here he speaks now of the resurrection of the mortal of the bodies of departed believers and then the translation of the bodies of living believers. And that's the revelation that will meet together in the clouds. And notice he uses the word we because apparently at this time <coughs> Paul felt that he would be among that number. Now, uh, God uh, did not tell him he would be, but he just assumed, so he uses the editorial we. But later on, of course, he would know otherwise that he would not be involved in the rapture, that he would have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. We know that because of what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, for the time, the hour of my departure is at hand. So here we have a revelation now. <clears throat> And then number four, we have a return. Chapter four and verse 16. For the Lord himself. You see, he's not going to send the divine heavenly Henry Kissinger. Uh, he's coming himself. Shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So the trumpet that we love to sing about, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, that return... <clears throat> will take place at the rapture. And then a resurrection, number five. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I want to stop a rumor that's going around that dead in Christ doesn't really refer to Baptist. But this speaks of the bodies of departed believers. Let me just zero in on a minute. Uh, in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians 15, Paul says, For this... Uh, corruption must put on incorruption. He's speaking of the same event here. And this mortality must put on immortality. Now, the corruption that he was talking about is the bodies of departed believers corrupting the ground. They'll put on incorruption. And the mortality, putting on immortality, that's the bodies of living believers. And we're mortal, and we'll put on immortality. And here, though, he speaks of the corruption putting on incorruption, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then the rapture. Then we, this is the mortality putting on immortality, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and then a reunion to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then a reassurance, wherefore comfort one another with these words. What a fantastic outline study Paul gives here. A realization a repose, a revelation, a return, a resurrection, a rapture, a union, and then a reassurance. Roman numeral one, the reputation of the church. Roman numeral two, the review of the church. Roman numeral three, the removal of the church. And now, Roman numeral four, the responsibility of the church. What is a local church to do? What is the uh, responsibilities of the believer in that local church. And this final section of Paul's epistles may be known as the full chapter uh, because of the uh, seven fulls that he mentions here. He says that we are to be watchful, respectful, mindful, joyful, prayerful, thankful, and faithful. We're to be watchful. Chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. What are we to watch for? The return of Christ. Why are we to watch for it? Well, because we belong to him. The bride ought to be concerned about the return of the bridegroom. And the body ought to be concerned about the return of the head of that body. So because of who we are and our relationship to the bridegroom and the body. All right? Not only because of who we are, should we watch for it, but because of what we shall escape. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath. Now this speaks of 
not only eternal wrath, the wrath of God abides on all unsaved people, but also tribulational wrath. One of the basic verses here that I think uh, can be used to point out the fact of the premillennial doctrine, pre-tribulational doctrine of the Bible, is these verses in 1 Thessalonians. Actually, he begins this uh, by uh, this promise, and he ends the epistle by the same promise. Check, compare 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9, with 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. God has not appointed us unto wrath. Now, I've used this illustration so much, but you remember the last thing that a king or president usually does before he declares war on another king or president, he calls his ambassadors home. Now, the tribulation is a time of all-out war, and God is going to declare war for seven years upon this earth. But we are his ambassadors, according to Second Corinthians chapter 5. So right before he declares war, he's going to call his ambassadors home. All right. Now, we are not only to be watchful, but we are to be respectful. Paul says, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So we're not to be worshipful now, as far as they're concerned, but to, we are to respect our leaders, not only because God has ordained them, but because they are responsible for our safety down here, our spiritual uh, growth, our lack of growth down here. And according to the book of Hebrews chapter 13, someday they'll give an account, they that watch for our souls. So we are to be respectful concerning the leaders, and then we are to be mindful. Mindful of what? And now we exhort you, brethren, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. We are to be mindful. Number four, we are to be joyful. Paul says, rejoice evermore. Now, this verse in the Greek is the shortest in the New Testament and not John eleven thirty five. 35. That's the shortest in the English, and that says Jesus wept. But rejoice evermore is the shortest, and in some way, though, it's the most difficult and one of the hardest to keep. Be joyful in everything. Number four, be Number five, be prayerful. In other words, be like Paul. Pray without ceasing. Number six, be thankful. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Someone has offered the following little rule, and I have it down here for you, and I've kept it in my Bible for a number of years. Be careful for nothing, be prayerful in everything, be thankful for anything. Of all the songs ever written, I think that little chorus, one of the greatest of all, perhaps, is the song, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. And then finally, be watchful, respectful, mindful, joyful, prayerful, thankful, be faithful. Paul says, be faithful in not quenching the Spirit. Now, we can quench the Spirit when we don't allow Him to have full sway in our life. And Paul is saying here, be faithful in allowing Him to control our lives. He says, quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, the Thessalonican church had apparently gone to the one extreme on this subject, while the Corinthian church would later go to the other extreme. Uh, they thought too much about it, but despise, despise not prophesying, be faithful in that. And then prove all things. Sniff it out, but don't swallow everything. Prove all things. Be faithful in uh, how you discern both men and earthly matters. Hold fast to that which is good, and abstain 
from all appearance of evil. Notice the grand conclusion now of Paul's first epistle to the church of Thessalonica. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. It's W-H-O-L-L-Y. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be, pre be preserved preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he, see we're to be faithful because he's faithful, that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. God commands you to read First Thessalonians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.